chapters of Code Orange, chapters 18 and 19. Chapter 18. The sun was going down on Valentine's Day. As they had on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, Derek and Olivia were walking in Riverside Park. They were going uptown with the Hudson River on their left and the strip of trees and tennis courts and pretty little stone buildings on their right. It was getting cold and dark, but the sidewalk was still a promenade for lovers. There were old couples and young couples, scary couples and sweet couples. Olivia and Mitty had stood on the edge of being a couple, but they hadn't quite become one. Olivia stared at the river. She could not imagine the actual act of stepping off this sidewalk and into that water. We're never going to know, she thought. He vanished, and we won't ever find out where he went or if somebody took him and what they did. How absurd Derek and I were to think that we could print out this smallpox paper and come up with some knowledge that would guide us to a rescue plan. Of course we didn't learn a thing, except that Mitty did fine research without me and that smallpox is quite literally the last thing on earth that you want. The FBI and the CDC were in touch constantly with Mr. and Mrs. Blake, who were in touch constantly with Derek and Olivia. But if they had found out anything or gotten anywhere, they did not tell the Blakes. Everybody was too slow, thought Olivia. Mitty was gone a dozen hours before the search really began. Any scene on a sidewalk, any witness to an event, event, any clue dropped in the street was already forgotten. Solving a crime is impossible for slow people. It's probably impossible for fast people who get there late. Ahead of them was a couple half dancing along as they held hands and leaned on each other with affection. Tied to the woman's wrist was a balloon bouquet, and clasped in the man's other hand was their dog leash. The dog was much shape and color. Small, ratty, and desert yellow. But the couple loved their dog. Olivia could tell because of the crisp valentine scarf tied so jauntily around its neck. The couple turned around and were now face to face with Olivia and Derek. They were old, wrinkled and gray, and giggling with love. Oh, Mitty thought Olivia. I want you to grow old. Don't die young. Remember the anti-war poem we read from Miss Abrams? asked Derek. By Wilfred Owen? In English, Mrs. Abrams skipped around. You'd be doing 10th century stuff, followed by 19th century stuff, whip back to 16th century, and circle around to the early, early 20th. Mrs. Abrams loved World War I literature. Don't tell your children the old lie. Dulce et decorum est pro patria mori, wrote Wil Wilfred Owen. That, that it is sweet and wonderful to die for your country, because it isn't. Dying for your country means choking on poison gas and rotting in a trench. Mitty didn't think it was an old lie, said Derek. He thought it was an old truth. It is pleasing and proper to die for your country. He respected people who died for their country. Mitty wasn't a pacifist. He said our teachers want us to roll over and play dead, but he would go bear hunting with a stick before he let anybody get away with stuff against his city. The previous fall, Olivia had not had a crush on Mitty, and since they were in different sections of English, she had not read his essay. But she remembered her own, in which she mocked people who died for their country, called them suckers. Mitty loved heroes, said Derek. What is a hero had been their next essay topic. Mitty said that a hero, Derek told her, is the guy who runs into the burning building to save the baby. Well, it's an okay definition if you save the baby, said Olivia. But what if you see the burning building and you hear the baby crying and you run as fast as you can, but you're not fast enough and you can't get through the flames? You could die trying and that would count. You can't be a hero unless people know, said Olivia. Well, he'd know, said Derek. I think that would be enough for me. Chapter 19 Mitty could no longer move his eyelids or his toes, not his fingers or even his tongue. The end was almost here. He heard voices shouting, feet smashing on the stair treads. He felt himself turned over, patted, examined. Not enough light! said someone clearly. But he was hoisted into the air and carried like the sack of lip flesh that he was. The person going up first held Minnie around the chest and under the arms, and that person was strong. 
The person holding Mitty's feet was not strong and let his heels catch on the steps. He was dropped. His skull clunked against the floor. He managed to open his eyes. His cheek was pressed on old speckled linoleum. The door to the outside had been left open. Icy wind filled the kitchen above his prison. Air, blessed air. But oxygen did not bring strength. Mitty could not lift his head or even pull his hands from under his twisted body. A car had been backed up to that kitchen door. All its doors had been left open. Ready, Mitty supposed, for everybody to leap in and drive on to their next destination. A destination, presumably, that Mitty would not like any better than this one. He had thought that, like the passengers in the plane over Pennsylvania, he could bring down the murderers with their own weapon. Well, he couldn't. The people hovering over him now were dressed in street clothes. He knew the woman by her brown boots, but she was not the one who spoke. Since Mitty could not lift his head, the other person knelt beside him. Gloved hands patted Mitty's face, and gloved hands pressed upward on his eyelids, forcing them open. From behind, a, a mask, this time a surgical mask, white and clean, a man said, So, you have it, the smallpox. Should have done your research, thought Mitty. I am impressed that you overcame your guards, but your victory lasts only a minute. You will kill your own people for us, and we will dance in your streets. He stood up. He was laughing. The woman in brown and the man in the mask went back down into the cellar to get the guards. No, thought Mitty Blake. You will not dance in my streets. Mitty Blake rolled over. He kicked the cellar door shut. The recorded low temperature on the night of February 14th and the dawn of February 15th in New York City was 15 degrees. The boy with no shirt on slept by an open door, the poison seeping out of his body. His 911 call took place on Sunday, February 15th at 2.22 p.m. Later, it was announced that the accidental deaths of four illegal aliens from carbon monoxide poisoning were due to a malfunctioning furnace. Two laptops and three cellular phones were confiscated by the NYPD. Work began to find a money trail, a paper trail, and links to terrorist groups. Fearing a general panic, the authorities did not publicize a terrorist attempt to acquire smallpox. The CDC made changes to their website, stating clearly and frequently that it was not possible to become infected with smallpox from old smallpox scabs, and that if such a scab were found, viable virus could not be recovered from that scab. Mitty Blake did not get smallpox. His injuries did, however, require a hospital stay. Not many people received permission to visit. The few people who did visit were shaken to find guards at the door of Mitty's room, to find themselves asked to produce identification and to have the contents of their bags examined. His parents told most people, classmates and neighbors and friends from the building and friends from the gym and friends from who knew where, that Mitty had been in a car accident, but he would be fine. Right now, he needed quiet. Mitty personally hated quiet and was glad to have the FBI and the NYPD and his parents and his sister around debriefing him. Everybody wanted every detail. There were some details Mitty did not plan to share. He was pretty sure his father knew this and pretty sure his mother never suspected. Emily had flown home from college and spent 24 hours a day, since they were all three sleepless with fear, promising their parents that Mitty would be found alive. All she said now was, Mitty Blake, how could you make that many stupid decisions in a row? His parents took turns sleeping in the chair next to Mitty's bed, and only when his sister or the FBI intervened would his mom and dad actually leave the room. Even then, his mother grilled the guard to make sure Mitty would be protected in her absence. On the third day, Derek and Olivia were allowed in. Since Mitty's mother and father and sister and the guard and a stray CDC official were there too, Greetings were stilted, and conversation was awkward. Finally, Emily took control and herded everybody out. When the door shut behind them, Derek came right to the point. So, uh, are you brain damaged? Because I read up on carbon monoxide poisoning. Are you functioning, or are you a vegetable? I am functioning at such a high level, said Mitty, hurling his dinner tray at Derek, that you will never attain it. Derek caught the tray like a frisbee, slung it back, and then whipped Mitty with a thermal blanket, accidentally scattering dozens of get-well cards. 
Mitty reached for a heavy pottery vase of flowers. Stop it, Mitty, commanded Olivia, or this hospital room is going to look as awful as your bedroom. You've been in my bedroom, said Mitty, <clears throat> grinning in spite of his wired jaw. What have I missed? Me, <clears throat> said Olivia. You've missed me. That night, his father helped him get ready for sleep, and his mother actually agreed not to spend the night in the chair, but to go on home and see him in the morning. Minnie knew it took courage for her to walk away. He knew his sister had worked to make it happen. He didn't have to tell Emily that he owed her, and she didn't have to tell him that it was okay. She just said, I won't see you at breakfast, Minnie. I'm flying back to school. His eyes teared up, one of the many annoyances of being ill. They all hugged, wordlessly exchanging farewells, except for his mother, who was never wordless. And at least, and at last, Mitty was alone. Mitty sat up in bed and looked out his window at New York City. He couldn't see much. It was kind of a boring view, actually. It could have been any city. But it's my city, thought Mitty Blake, and no bad guys are dancing in my streets. That was the end of the book, guys. I really hope that you enjoyed it. Code Orange by Caroline B. Cooney.